Greetings, everyone. My name is Kate Rademacher, and I'm here with Writing for Your Life. I'm really delighted to have um, our guest on today, Casey Tigret, who's an author and a speaker and a spiritual director. Um, Casey has written a wonderful new book called The Gift of Restlessness, which I've been really blessed to get an advanced copy of. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Casey's background, and then we're going to turn it over to him to tell us more about the book and, and what prompted him to write this. So, um, welcome, Casey. Thank you so much for being here. And just reading your bio blurb, um, Casey's a speaker and the director of spiritual direction and practice for soul care, which helps church and nonprofit leaders restore health to their souls. Casey is the author of Becoming Curious and As I Recall, and he is the host of Otherwise Podcast. He holds degrees from Lincoln Christian Seminary and his family, um, and he lives in Chicago. So thanks again, Casey, for being with us. And, and as I said, I was really uh, so grateful and, and blessed to receive an advanced copy of your book. And remind, tell, remind me, when does it officially come out? April 25th. April 25th. Right. It feels like a long way away, but it's not. Yeah, so we have to wait a little bit. But yeah, so tell us more about or tell us about the book and kind of about yourself and how how this project came came about. Sure. And well, it's a it's a pleasure to talk with you about this. And I find that talking about a book has an interesting, it's an interesting different experience than writing a book. Um, uh, because it's uh when you're in the early parts of the process, you don't quite know how things are going to go. And that's, I think if I had to talk about this book, that would be like the unstated subtitle, which is, we're not sure how this is going to go. Um, as, as many people uh, experienced 2020 through 22, um, this book really is, is, a, is a way of reflect. I feel like writing a lot of times is a way of caring for yourself. Um, whether it's realizing something that you feel or believe when you put it on the page or just the practice gives order to your life. And so um, like everyone, 2020 was a, a crazy time, but also what was universal uh, was also very particular. So there are some significant things that happened in our life. And I actually had this book in a form, a manuscript form, kind of laying around. I had created it. I you know, put it in a drawer and just said, well, maybe we'll come back to it later. And it was a very different book than the one that ended up in your hands right now because the stories and the the beauty and the brutality of 2020 through 22 uh, created some new new things to talk about. And so uh, the reason I wrote this is because I, I needed to. I needed to make sense of some things. Also, I needed to talk about something that had been a part of my life for years and the idea of restlessness, this irritated, unsettled feeling that says we're sort of stuck in the present tense and can't go back the way things were before. And we have no idea what the future is going to look like. So I wanted a way to, I wanted a way to express that. I wanted a way to think about that. And I wanted to see if there was anyone else who was in the same spot. And I think that's true of any book. So this is not, not like mine is unique in this way, but we're always trying to process something and uh, we're trying to see if there's anyone else out there who feels the same way. But that was really the energy behind it. And and just there's always unique stories, backstories to books. Uh, one piece is that I, I, in the middle of the deep editing, I got COVID. And my wife and I have experienced some foggy brain that has lingered. And so trying to write, finish editing in the midst of not being able to really put together thoughts and sentences and, you know, what are the last four digits of my phone number? Like, you can't go from that to how do I give structure to this chapter in the course of a, you know, the whole book. Uh, so it, it was a unique adventure. Um, and I'm still not quite sure where, where the book is headed, but, and that fills me with a bit of excitement too, because, you know, there's a lot of possibility. Yeah. Well, it's like writing and publishing this book is is an example of restlessness, it sounds like. And so maybe that's a good segue. Um, you know, can you just, you, you sort of mentioned it, but can you tell us how you define restlessness? And, um, you know, and and maybe I know, I, as I was telling you before we started the podcast, I'm in a period of big change in my life. And I, so I resonate with this idea of rest, restlessness, but I also, it, it feels so uncomfortable. So maybe can you, you know, share your definition and sort of, does it, does it have to be uncomfortable? That's the part of the definition. <laughs> I, I, well, I'll answer the first, the second part first. I do think it has to be a bit uncomfortable uh, because most of the good things that happen to us are 
make us uncomfortable. Um, I say most, that's a bit of a generalization, but the things that really propel us forward in growth along, whether it's spiritual stages or in relationships, they, they are a little bit uncomfortable. But I define restlessness as a feeling of irritation and unsettledness that we experience as we are stuck in a present tense kind of moment. Uh, the best way to articulate it is uh, bartenders have a phrase at the end of the night where they say, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Um, I would say the best way to use that phrase is to say, I can't go back, but I also know I, I can't go forward. And so a lot of times it comes about when there is change, uh, when they, we know we cannot, the faith that brought us here will not take us there. Uh, the relationship, the marriage that we have has changed, whether through an experience or just through getting older and growing, growing older together. Um, but we don't know what the future really looks like. And so we're sort of stuck in that present tense and we would love to avoid it. Um, restlessness is not something any of us want, uh, but it's something that we need. And it's where all those really good juicy human, which means if it's human, it's spiritual. Those, those questions start to pop up about protection and safety. And is there enough? And do I belong? Um, how do I get through this time? Can the world be mended? You know, right when we're stuck in that place where we can't go back, but can't go forward, we're confronted with those really human questions. And so, uh, you know, just to come back to 2020, that was a time when a lot of our default ways of dealing with God, self, and others were removed. Um, people were doing church online or isolated from their faith communities. People were in homes with family that they, because of work or because of school rhythms, they hadn't seen in a while. And some people were like, these people are great. I'd like to see them more. And some folks were like, I don't know these people. And it's a bit uncomfortable. Um, we get to know ourselves a little bit, our, our fears, our, our hesitancies the things that we would rather other people not see, those present tense moments really raise all of that to the level of visibility. And so that's restlessness for me. It's, it's either needing to move forward or trying to avoid the stuck point we're in, or sometimes restlessness is just everything needs to change. Um, and I don't know where it's going. I don't know how it needs to change. All I know is that everything that's happening right now needs to be different. And that's something that I experience it, it, probably every six weeks or so. I go through this little, this little <laughs> dip, and I'm sure I'm not alone. Where I'm like, I'm going to grow some facial hair, and my wife's like, No, you're not, because you've never been able to do that. It looks terrible. Don't <laughs> don't do that. Or I'm going to change a routine, or use a new fitness app, or whatever. We have these abilities to to try and avoid the feeling that something needs to change, and I don't know what, and I can't change it. And uh, I do think that's where we meet the divine. That's where God meets mm -hmm. us because that's a that's a very stripped bare kind of moment. So so mm -hmm. that's a long answer to what was a lovely question about what mm -hmm. is restlessness. But um, there's a whole other book that kind of explains that too. So. Yeah. Well, thank you. And I, I love what you're saying. It's like it's like you're in my you're in my head and my heart. And I and I I really appreciate sort of the way you are recognizing and honoring how. Um, collectively the last few years have been such a time of change and upheaval for so many of us. And I think we've known that and we've been talking about it all along, but I know for myself, it's like hitting me now in a deeper way. Like this really has been, <laughs> the last few years have really been something. Um, and all of the feelings you're talking about, again, about fear and is there enough and protection? I mean, those all really resonate. And so my next question is, what do we do? You know, what do we do in those, in those moments? Um, you know, for me, it's, it's less about accepting the need for change. I recognize the need for change and, and in my own life of making steps to, to, you know, to step into that change. But again, it's uncomfortable. What do we do with the fear? What do we do with the, you know, discomfort, the anxiety? Um, how do we be patient? Um, you know, can you talk about sort of what either in your book or in your own life sort of you, you recommend to others? Yeah. Well, the, the, the quote unquote good thing about most restless situations is we feel like we have a choice on what to do with it. And it's an illusion. We really don't. The story for me that I feel like guides this so well is the story of Jesus uh, early on 
with baptism, um, this Christian story of Jesus's baptism in the Jordan River by John the Baptist, and it and it it's a moment where it just throws every expectation up in the air that people had. Um, the status quo. And so imagine this in the light of what we all experienced in 2020 or what someone who's experiencing a marriage falling apart or a faith falling apart, all the defaults just got thrown up in the air. And then after that, there's this moment where it says, and he was led by the spirit into the wilderness. And I, I've read that a hundred, I, I can't tell you how many times, um, mm -hmm. just through study and whatever, but I never really focused on that little, that one little word led you know, it, the wilderness was not a place where Jesus desired to go. Mm -hmm. And so for most of us, those restless things are not, we don't want that. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, we've engineered our life in a lot of ways, either through not looking at it, not confronting it, or not putting ourselves in places where it might happen. We've tried to avoid it. And so Jesus has taken into the wilderness, this desolate, stripped away place where all the choice that we thought we had to deal with our own powerlessness, to deal with our own hunger, to make ourselves look relevant and spectacular to the world where all those things are pulled away. And psychologically, what happens is in those restless moments, our, our natural lizard brain impulses kick in. We either want to fight it. This isn't what it looks like. And I'm going to, I'm going to get through this in a good American, pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of way. Uh, there's the giving up. There's the flopping where I'm just going to give into this. There's the fleeing of escapism. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm restless, and so I'm going to do blank to try and forget that. And so all of those, we find the end of it, and we don't find a solution. We actually found more trauma, chaos, and pain. But what we find in Jesus is he just stays. And mm -hmm. it's so simple, it actually is irritating a little bit. He just remains mm -hmm. and stays with it. And I love that mm -hmm. Mark, I think, articulates this so well. He says that Jesus was between the wild beasts and the angels. Mm. And that picture to me is what it looks like for us to really deal with the restlessness is that we remain between this thing that feels like a threat to our existence and the future, which we believe has to be better than this. And I think that's how we process it. We look it square in the eyes, we smell its breath, we feel the wind on our neck of it behind us, gripping us saying, you're never going to get out of this. And we just wait with that. And God meets us there in sometimes in creative acts, the way the things we make, sometimes in the conversations we have, sometimes just in our processing and spiritual direction or therapy. And we just sit with that restless fear, anxiety, anxiousness, and we call it what it is. Um, and then we start to learn from it. So that's a, that is such a 60,000 foot view and so easy to say on a podcast, but some of what I'm processing through in the book is, okay, and this is how I've tried it. These are the ways that I've failed spectacularly. And these are the ways that maybe, um, maybe there's been a little bit of success. Maybe there's been some goodness too, that's come out of this. So yeah, I think it's the, the abiding with it. We engage our restlessness by remaining in between the past that we can't go back to and the future we have no clue about. We meet the divine there. Well, again, I feel like you've been reading my journal or, you know, looking at Jeremy's brain. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for these words are from, you know, again, for me, and I'm sure for many sort of coming at a pivotal moment and and I love what you're saying about, you know, we're, we spend so much time engineering our lives or trying to engineer our lives. And, you know, what I'm really hearing from you is that's not, that's not what Jesus did. And, and, you know, we can't engineer these moments. We have to abide in them. So thank you for that. Um, I'd like to pivot if that's okay and talk a little bit. I was, um, you know, as, as you know, this is for the writing for your life podcast and um, writing for your life is a community of, of uh, spiritual writers and readers and so I was really excited to read um, kind of in the middle of your book, you had a section about restlessness and writing and being a, mm -hmm. uh, being a restless writer. Um, so I'm looking at page 78 and 79, and um, I don't know if maybe uh, I could even read a little bit or you could read a little bit, but you talk about, um, you know, some of the ego that writers get caught up in um, sort of you, you write here about, you know, being hungering for success and, um, and that, 
there's a particular restlessness that's part of a writer's life. And you also mentioned going out to the dream shed. So um, I'm wondering if you can tell us what the dream shed is, first of all, and then, you know, talk a little bit about what, what are some of the ways that in your, in your life as a writer, and perhaps the ways you've seen it play out for other writers, how, what are some of the particular restlessnesses, <laughs> if that's a word, uh, that we can be afflicted by? Yeah. Oh, my. That's such a good question. And I'm not saying that to stall. Uh, <laughs> I, I think you could be in the, you could be in the in-between moment of the question and the answer. <laughs> Kate, you're making me restless. Um, the, the unique thing about those of us and those of you who are listening, who, who have taken on that name writer is that uh, we have decided to take a part of us and put it on display if we're really doing the work, if we're really writing, especially from a, as people with a, a faith commitment, a commitment to mystery, to our spirits, to something beyond us, but also a commitment to this craft, we have given, we have decided and agreed and made a contract with readers that we're going to give a part of ourselves away. And that vulnerability is, is necessarily a restless thing because there's, once you put something out there, there's no going back. And I, I had more in this book. So some of the stories in the book, especially early on, are fairly transparent. And there are other people's stories. But there are stories about things that were significantly traumatic. And I had to make the decision, uh, do, I, do I really want to open that door? Because once I walk through that door, uh, there's no going back. And, and we should. I think good writing requires us to walk through doors that maybe we're just like 75% comfortable walking through. Um, and, and that doesn't mean that kind of writing is good, whether or not it gets shared with the world, but should you share it with the world in a blog or an article or a spoken word piece or wherever your writing takes you a podcast? Um, once that door is open, you walk through it and then you're in between, you know, I can't go back to the time before I said that wrote that quoted that. But I also have no idea what is going to come out of this. And what am I learning about myself? And as I react to this, and I think the process of writing will inevitably, especially if we're writing for publication, will bring us head to head with what we believe about success. Success in terms of what is successful for our souls, like what is it that that builds me up and inspires me and engages me. And also success in terms of um, how much do we want to achieve in, in based on certain metrics? You know, I have friends who who write and self publish, and they just write all the time, and they're constantly publishing things. And their metric is, I finished what I what was in me got out, and I put it out in the world. Let's move on. Um, others are, you know, really working on. Maybe they have. And that they have a promise to a publisher to write something, or maybe they just are responding to this invitation of the spirit and saying, I just need to do this. This is just what I need to do. It's restlessness will help us define what do we believe about succeeding in this. Mm -hmm. And, and that word may even become irrelevant. I mean, the way, the way that we learn about our own concepts of success and failure, when it comes to writing, we may come to terms with the fact that you know, there is no way for me to succeed at writing. I just write and it's part of me. This is who I am. And the reason that matters is that you mentioned the dream shed. Um, it's a, it's a place in Boulder, Colorado that's owned by some dear friends of mine and actually uh, the founder of soul care who I work for Mindy Caliguire, who's a wonderful writer and speaker and retreat leader. And they built these little tiny houses uh, on their property and uh, just outside of Boulder. And actually, after I wrote the, uh, around the time I wrote the book, there was a, there were some massive fires that went through and actually burned um, the shed that I wrote in down. Uh, but after that, they had a partnership with some people who helped them build not only the old one, but two new ones. And so there are three dream wow. sheds now, which is wonderful. But I just needed that time outside of the rhythms of, of life and ministry and family to focus on creating. And there's something about, I was, you know, 
I was out in the middle of, it's the middle of nowhere, pretty much. Uh, there wasn't any power to the shed at the time. So we had a, we had a solar generator and I ran my laptop off of that. And it was September in Colorado, which the sun was gorgeous, no humidity. Uh, it was perfect. It was a little warm. And I just sat overlooking um, this beautiful space and these incredible pine trees that had been there for way, way longer than I've been alive. And just sitting in the middle of that and seeing the, the creativity of creation, it was just incredibly inspiring. But I also had, um, and I think there are people who are listening, and you obviously will resonate with this, I was on a deadline. And I had scheduled this as the way to meet the deadline because, you know, not all of us, but some of us writers like to push it right to the end. And I was like, well, I'll just take this day and we'll finish it. And so there was all this beauty and creativity out there. And I could see the fact that if I just let myself get swept up in the divine who created all of this, that this creative work of this book was going to go fine. There was also the sense of, I cannot go back and work on this more diligently in months past so that I don't feel this weight of this has to get done soon and I don't want to ask for another extension, et cetera. So the dream shit was actually this, it was a great moment for me, but it was also a moment of, of sitting between, you know, just living out the theme of the book. I am between these two places and learning about myself, learning what you will write when you are under pressure and what will you sacrifice in your writing when you are under pressure? What will you give up? What will you what will you hope for? What will you want to happen versus what do you need to happen? And so it was a really interesting moment. I don't know if that answered your question at all. I just started talking, but uh, that, that is the part of the writing that really tapped most closely into the, the subject of restlessness. That and just you know having foggy brain from COVID and trying to put things together, that was also, but that was a different, that felt a little different than something like, sitting in the middle of this beautiful creation going, oh, this is going to be fine. And, oh, it would be more fine if you had just applied yourself <laughs> earlier. I, I love that. I mean, it sounds like there's a trust in, there's there was a trust in that moment of pressure, both of what needs to come forward and maybe what you have to let go of because you just have to out of practical need. Um, and I think if I'm hearing you right, it sounds like there was a lot of divine energy in that tension of the of the time pressure that allowed you to both um perhaps be more fully creative and let go of some stuff out of necessity so um and i love your description of the dream shed it sounds like just the metaphor of the fire and you know one burning down and then two or three coming out of the fire i think is maybe a, a good metaphor for uh, what you're talking about which is you know there's this painful destruction and letting go of our old selves, but then we don't know what's coming, coming out of it. So, um, so just in our last few minutes, I think what, you know, what I know I'm hungry for, and I think I'm, I'm sure our listeners for are sort of like, um, practical strategies. We want to control things, right? We want to engineer things. So I love your, um, you know, I love your word abide earlier. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, you even just touched on one and in, as you were talking about the need for solitude and you wrote, wrote about that in the section about writers, the sort of need to um, view solid, seeking solitude as a spiritual practice. Um, I know that's something I've really explored and written about, whether it's Sabbath keeping or, you know, prayer, retreat, meditate, contemplative prayer, meditation. So are there, um, for lack of better word, tools, or, you know, perhaps a better word is practices that you recommend to people who are in periods of restlessness or change um, that you can share or maybe yeah. amplify since a lot of these are you know, ancient practices, of course. Sure. I do like that language of practice. I think because so often when we talk about disciplines, there's a feeling of the need to be an expert. Um, disciplines are disciplined people do disciplines whereas practices practice is what you do so that you can do something else so i i love dallas willard and the idea of indirection how do you change things that you can change so that you change the things that you can't and that's probably a whole other podcast but i think practices is a great word for it because practice implies that you can fail and if you're allowed to fail when you practice, then you learn how to succeed. 
when. So the practices allow us to confront those restless moments by not confronting them directly, but simply knowing what they are and how we deal with them. So solitude is a big part of that because um, it allows us to connect deeply with the divine as the first source of wisdom. When you're, when you're going through a restless season, you know, I have, I have friends who I'll talk to and go get a drink with and, and whatever, and they, they have tons of good advice and they're wonderful people. And I do appreciate the wisdom of spirit through other people, but sometimes they also have not reckoned with their own restlessness. And so they're giving us advice out of their own restlessness. And that's doubly unhelpful. It's not their fault, but it's just, it requires a, it requires a second opinion. So solitude mm -hmm. allows us to connect deeply mm -hmm. with the divine as the first source of wisdom. So I think practicing solitude on a regular basis is key to the writing life. Um, I don't know many people who write well in a crowd. Uh, sometimes it's, it's all you have. And I would say that's better than nothing, but if you can find a dream shed or, a or um, a room at, at you, the church you attend, you know, I'm just thinking of places where you can, if you can call the shots on what's happening in your environment, uh, that practice is critical. And being in that space, and one of the great things about practices is they do bring to the surface the restlessness that we have. Um, so solitude always brings to the front the restlessness we have around being alone mm -hmm. and when you're in solitude there's no one there for you to bounce your identity off of um, mm -hmm. you're completely unguarded you're in you and your thoughts and that's the one of the wonderfully odd things about writing is when you write in solitude uh, i've had this conversation with people in the past you write and then you put it out in the world and somebody reads it and they say something about it and you go that was just me in my basement. Um, and now I'm giving this thing to you. And I was by myself and I'm reading it back going, this is, you know, we go through this sway between this is the worst thing I've ever written to, I think this is really great. And that may happen with the same piece and the same day. So writing in solitude strips away all of the things that may tell you that good, bad, better, worse. It, it allows you to just sit with things as they are. So I think solitude is a great practice. I, I think one of the biggest things is really just naming, naming what you're restless about and starting there and realizing we may name something. And once we put it out there and look at it, uh, I like, I like journaling. I don't think journaling is for everybody, but I think people who have a writing bent tend to journal more or better because it's just native to, to the way we're wired. But you write down the thing that you're restless about. And then if you look at it and write it in pen, I would suggest, um, I like writing in pencil. I'm finding that more compelling these days, but write it in pen because then it can't go anywhere. And as you look at it, you may say, well, that's close. Actually what I'm really, and the more we dig through those layers, we get to the heart of the thing that stuck us between the wild beasts and the angels. And we, we can sit with it then and say, actually, honestly, here's what I'm, here's what I'm really worried about. Here's what I'm really stuck on. Uh, so that's a, that's a good practice. Um, I think assessing seasons of life too. Um, we talked a little bit about spiritual direction. One of the things that I feel is most helpful as a spiritual director is try to talk to people about, you know, what season of life are you in? And use the actual seasons. So is this a spring when things are growing and you feel alive and vibrant and your restlessness is around, okay, what do I do with this? Or mm -hmm. summer where everything is hot and, and it's alive and you're like, how do I keep this going? Or it's fall and you feel like things are starting to go into hibernation mode and it's still beautiful, but there's this quiet dark that you sense is just on the horizon. So I think a practice of just assessing what season that you're in and naming that and saying, how, how does this season inform or inspire or motivate the restless feeling that I have? And again, uh, the key is just to be able to sit with it, call it what it is and know the best part about the story of Jesus in the wilderness is that he was never alone. Uh, mm -hmm. Solitude and loneliness are not the same thing. And mm -hmm. so he was always accompanied and 
And I believe we are too. Anytime we confront our restlessness, we never do that alone. We are always accompanied. We are always haunted in the best way possible by the divine. So those are a few practices. I include some practices in the book at, at the end of each chapter as well. Um, one of the key pieces of the book is the Lord's Prayer. Um, I encourage people to write their own version of it. Um, that can be uncomfortable for people, depending on your view of scripture. But um, I think there is something about taking such a key, solid human question or human um, prayer. I tried to imagine the Lord's Prayer and then what is the question behind each of the phrases? What's the thing that we would be asking? And then what would we pray as a result? And I think crafting your own version of it, which I do at the end of the book, can be really helpful. It can give you some insight into how do we sit with the divine in the midst of this restlessness. Well, thank you so much for that, Casey. And I just, you know, I think overall, I just really appreciate you normalizing restlessness. And um, because again, I think there's so much anxiety that comes with change and, and being in that in-between time. So to really, I think one of the biggest gifts I receive from your book is this idea that restlessness is a gift and is a time, as you said, to be led by the spirit, um, uh, which may evoke some uncomfortable feelings, but, you know, is going to be taking us to holy um, and unknown and holy places. So thank you for that. So can we just end, can you tell us again a little bit about when your book is going to be out? I know you mentioned it's going to be in April and how people can connect with you online and how they can get your book when it's, when it's out. Sure. Yeah. So release date is April 25th. Obviously um, you can pre-order at any time, um, anytime after March. Uh, March 1 would be great. Uh, there will be some some goodies for people who pre-order. So uh, if you're interested in that idea, uh, my website is just my name, caseytigret.com. Um, you can find the book on Amazon or uh, it's with Broadleaf Books. So they offer that on their site as well. I'm also somewhat on social media um, at Casey Tigret, both on Facebook and, and Instagram. I'm steering clear of Twitter these days because um, Twitter's not fun anymore. So <laughs> So you can yeah. find me on Facebook and Instagram. And uh, I'd love to, if you've read this uh, book or if you have a curiosity around the idea, um, I'd love to have a conversation. I think that's the best part of being a writer and getting the supreme pleasure of putting something like this out into the world is I'd love to, I'd love to see how it hits and how I can be further helpful beyond the page. So, and thank you, Kate, for this opportunity, which is great. It's an opportunity for me to do that. Well, thank you so much again, Casey. And just for a final flash, here's the advanced copy of The Gift of Restlessness, A Spirituality for Unsettled Seasons. And so many of us are in that season. So again, thank you for the gift of your words and the gift of this ministry to the to the world, really, as you, as you talk about this. So blessings. Um, you can find additional podcasts um, and book launch interviews at writingforyourlife.com. And again, thanks so much, Casey, for being with us today. Pleasure. Thank you.